Tierney, in the architecture of Venice. Um, but he's a person who I really can't say enough good things about. Uh, he is really prolific uh, with writing and publishing books and series, uh, one of which is over here, um, Tickets of Service, uh, which that this presentation is really based on. Um, he got some flyers to, to, to come out with a pro story. Um, with a discount. Right. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Charles. Th thank you for the invitation. Um, um, but it's always good to be in Bristol. Um, it's, a, it's a great city. Uh, for me, it's a place of old friends and good memories. Um, I, was, I was married in Bristol in 1980, and I was examined for my PhD here in 2002. So there's been some sort of key, key events. Um, in the book, um, in the chapter on carving the surface, I examined the surfaces of Charles Holden's splendid Bristol Central Library. But I'm, I'm, I won't be talking about that today. I can't cover the whole book in 45 minutes, but uh, there, there is a Bristol connection there. So to begin, in his classic, The Englishness of English Art of 1956, based on the BBC Reith lectures he gave in 1955, the German art historian Nikolaus Pevsner identified a national mania, a national English mania for beautiful surface quality and an English pleasure in the overall decoration of a surface. For Pevsner, nothing could be more English than the vast Elizabethan Hardwick Hall in Derbyshire. As compared to the plastic molding of space found elsewhere in Europe, we have here a composition that is rectangular and blocky. The building is assembled from flat surface planes as distinct spatial compartments and volumes. Here the grid derives from perpendicular architecture. Again, a uniquely English flowering of late medieval architecture. And as in the famous saying, Hardwick Hall more glass than wall, the grid and glass appears to anticipate modernist architecture, leading Pevsner to hope that England seems predestined to play a leading part in modern architecture. Here on the left is perpendicular architecture as represented in the cartoon-like drawings of Osbert Lancaster's Pillar to Post of 1938. It is the architecture of King's College Chapel, Cambridge, it is also in large part, I was just popped in this morning before, the, as I came from the train, the wonderful St. Mary Redcliffe across, across the way has some glorious perpendicular architecture as well. And on the right, the Elizabethan we have met at Hardwick Hall already. Osbert Lancaster's images capture the flat surfaces of Georgian urban architecture, as in London's Bedford Square. And in the Rus Victorian era, the John Ruskin inspired textures of municipal Gothic revival, as we shall shortly examine in more detail. In the lineage from Ruskin to William Morris, we shall also look at the interior play of surfaces of the artistic arts and crafts interior. And then there are the surfaces and material instincts of the 20th century which proved to be far from merely functional. Another important classic study is Alec Clifton Taylor's The Pattern of English Building of 1962, whose plates superbly capture the diverse materiality of English building, reflecting the underlying geological diversity. As in the, these fine images of weatherboarding, and here, limestone and brick. But here, a note of caution is needed. It has been said that nationality is an address, not a consciousness. A lot of things happen at that address. The problems of eliding that geological address too strongly with notions of national consciousness can be seen starkly in the case of Pevsner himself who was forced to become an emigre in England 
when in September 1933, he was dismissed from his academic post in Germany at Göttingen University under the Nazi race laws. In fact, Pesner had begun his interest in a geography of art, in a Kunstgeography, and in the national characteristics of English art and architecture while at Göttingen. Yet in the blood and soil aesthetics of fascism, we see the worst racist outcomes of blindly confusing nationalism and culture. At the same time, distinctive architectures did develop within this British address. These geographical boundaries do describe sites wherein shifting groups of peoples and cultures have consistently made buildings within a vortex of ideas, topography, climate, geologies, politics and manners that have engendered recognizable patterns, not least in those affecting the surfaces and materiality of architecture we are investigating here. Equally difficult is the question of Englishness and Britishness. If I use the term somewhat flexibly in this talk, it is in no way to elide England with the other nations of Britain, such as Wales and Scotland. Take the idea of the picturesque, for example. Are you familiar with the picturesque? Fairly, fairly, all right. Which can be claimed as a genuinely British invention and export, as in the case of the English landscape garden. The idea of the picturesque is a strong theme in Pevsner's The Englishness of English Art. Yet it was first clearly defined on the Welsh-English borders of the Wye Valley and one of its greatest artists was the Welshman Richard Wilson. It was, it was first identified in William Gilpin's observation on the River Wye of 1782, making a new aesthetic category between the existing 18th century ones of the beautiful on the left and the sublime, between the smoothness and symmetry of classical architecture, as in Chatsworth, and the awesome vastness of the sublime as in Turner's storm painting on the right. This new aesthetic category can be summed up in the newfound pleasures for ruins, such as the Wye Valley's Tinton Abbey. Instead of classical smoothness, picturesque pleasures are to be found in roughness and irregularity. The picturesque sensibility loves surface texture and weathering. And its affection for ruins and fragments encourages the bricolage of a part to whole aesthetic. In researching this book, I knew the picturesque would be a strong strand, but even I was surprised by how strong a thread it proved to be, appearing as a revenge to modernism, even within brutalism, high tech, and neo vernacular architecture. Here on the left is Richard Wilson's picturesque view of a castle near Thlangothlan in Wales. And on the right, we have Thomas Rowlandson in 1799, satirizing an artist traveling in Wales, weighted down with the tools of his art as he sets off in the typical lashing Welsh rain to seek picturesque subjects. So in the time available, I shall inspect four phases of these surface stories, namely, John Ruskin and the Wall Veil, William Morris and the layering of the domestic surface, surfaces and the picturesque Sharawagi of the interwar period, and in the post-war era, brutalism to postmodernism. It might seem odd that we must continue our surface inquiries by traveling to Venice with that great art writer, John Ruskin to understand why architecture took the surface path it did in the second half of the 19th century, namely the direction of the sophisticated and romantic neo-medievalism of Ruskin himself, George Edmund Street, Philip Webb, William Morris, and so on. Surely economy and function should have dictated that it would take the iron and glass direction indicated by the Crystal Palace and the vast sheds of the railway stations. Temple Meads is obviously one of them. A path that is about the skeletal frame, not the surface. 
but architecture is driven as much by cultural factors as by those of economy and function. Despite Ruskin's scorn for a new style of iron architecture, the magnificent great court of the Oxford University Museum, created under Ruskin's influence, shows the path that a ferro-vitreous architecture might have taken, but didn't. The makers of the exoskeletons of 1960s and 1970s high tech saw themselves as continuing the bravura achievements of the Crystal Palace and the Great Railway Termini. For Archigram co-founder Peter Cook, this tradition of audacious invention was as much part of the English psychology as the Meccano sets these architects had played with as children. I think you're a bit old for Meccano, but uh, Lego perhaps? I don't know. But on closer inspection, the layered surface play of these exoskeletons proves as ornamental as any Victorian polychrome. And the great cast gerberets of the Pompidou Centre sit firmly within the British arts and crafts passion for craft and detail. So, for the first part of this lecture, we are now in Venice with John Ruskin. In the first of the three volumes of his hugely influential The Stones of Venice of 1851-3, Ruskin defines the wall veil, one of his most remarkable and influential contributions to architectural terminology. A wall, he says, is an even and united fence, whether of wood, earth, stone or metal. And in another key passage, quote, but this is to be noted of all good wall ornament, that it retains the expression of firm and massive substance and of broad surface. And that architecture instantly declined when linear design was substituted for massive and the sense of weight or wall was lost in a wilderness of upright or undulating rods." End quote. In the second volume, in the chapter on Gothic palaces, Ruskin describes how the wall veils emerge in the Gothic period, out of the earlier 13th century Byzantine palaces, such as we find here, for example, at the Rialto, which have no surfaces to speak of. Instead, they are composed of tier upon tier of stilted arches on slender columns. The transition to the pointed arch Gothic architecture can be seen in this palace, where the OG outer arch is appointed, showing the emerging Gothic spirit, whereas the inner part of the arches are still of stilted round arch Byzantine forms. As Ruskin describes, the long Byzantine arcades break into pieces and coagulate into central and lateral windows and small arch doors pierced in great surfaces of brick wall. Now, says Ruskin, the whole wall of the palace was considered as the page of a book to be illuminated. The splendor with which the Venetians illuminated the urban pages offered by these new Gothic surface fields can be seen in contemporary paintings, such as Mansueti's Miracle of the Relic of the Holy Cross. Most of this glory has faded away as it was made in humble paint on plaster. But the great checker patterns of the Doge's palace survive as they were diapered in white history and stone and pink Verona marble. See how this wall veil is rolled out like a great carpet of textile, irrespective of the Gothic windows cut into it. In fact, the Doge's palace uses the Byzantine love of continuous arcades in its lower stories and the Gothic feeling for surface in its upper parts. Along with these checker patterns, which are like oriental carpets or the shields of knights, goes the principle of architectural stratification, which as a keen geologist, Ruskin had learned from his explorations of mountain precipices in the Alps. Ruskin studied the, the, the facade of the Cathedral of Monza, north of Milan, which is like a mountain face of the nearby Alps, a broad stratified cliff 
of stone and marble. Back in Britain, under Ruskin's influence, we have the checkerware constrata of William Butterfield's All Saints Margaret Street, whose vivid brick polychromy and savage surfaces are a strident rejoinder to the grey skies and smog of central Victorian London. The great Victorian architect George Edmund Street, designer of the law courts in London, was also a close reader of Ruskin. He also travelled in northern Italy in 1853, and, uh, which he published as Brick and Marble in the Middle Ages in 1855. The final pages of this book are an impassioned appeal for colour in construction. Says Street, the task and duty of architects at the present day is awakening and then satisfying this feeling for colour. In Britain, he points out, there are plenty of available materials. We have alabaster, large fields of marbles, an exhaustless supply of granites of various colours, building stones of many tints, many of which may be very effective when contrasted in addition to these natural materials, we have every facility for making the most perfect bricks. Street's Church of All Saints, Boyne Hill Maidenhead, celebrates this rich British material sampling. The astonishingly abstract chancel wall shows another of Street's colour rules, namely, to separate all colours by lines, either of metal or black. This will give distinctness and prevent confusion. The bands are also striking in their similarity to contemporary geological sectional drawings, such as those in Robert Bakewell's Introduction to Geology of 1833. Along with the geological metaphors, architects were very interested to learn what the new science of geology could tell them about the properties of their raw materials. Discoveries of fossils and the actual enormous age of the earth were a challenge to literal Victorian readers of the Bible. Though himself a committed amateur geologist, Ruskin had nightmares in which he held his ears against, quote, those dreadful geological hammers. I hear the clink of them at the end of every cadence of the Bible verses. So powerfully abstract is this Boyd Hill chancel wall, it reminds me of the lyrical colour field paintings of Barnett Newman, one of the leading New York abstract painters of the 1950s. And here in Bristol, you can admire the black and buff polychromy of the Venetian Byzantine granary on the quayside near Queen Square. You notice that one? Yeah, good. <clears throat> So much for the surfaces of palaces of public and mercantile architecture. But in this second part of the talk, to understand the evolution of surfaces in Britain in domestic architecture and the decoration of the domestic interior, we must turn to William Morris and his home of Red House. The house Philip Webb designed for Morris in 1859 to 60 in Bexley Heath near London, after leaving the office of George Edmund Street where he had been chief, chief, Street's chief draftsman for six years. Morris also met and befriended Webb in his brief time in Street's office, although Morris soon gave up architecture in his turn to domestic decoration. <clears throat> Whatever you have in your rooms, think first of the walls, for they are that which make your home, said William Morris. His utopia that news from nowhere opposes Victorian utilitarianism to pre present the spirit of the new days as a delight in the life of the world, intense and overweening love of the very skin and surface of the earth on which man dwells. This frontispiece of news from nowhere shows Kelmscott Manor, the beautiful 17th century house near Oxford that Morris made his country home from the 1870s. <clears throat> to again bring in Nicholas Pevsner, his Pioneers of the Modern Movement of 1936, later published as Pioneers of Modern Design, 
famously made Red House an icon of modernity for its picturesque and solidly unpretentious character, for its honestly raw red brick external surfaces unmasked by plaster, and for its one room and a corridor plan bent into an L of Ruskinian changefulness. However, these hard red brick planes and the open L plan are literally only half the intended story of Red House. Originally, the other two sides of this half L plan quadrangle were completed by rose trellises, making a square inner court in the middle of which rose Webb's striking well house of brickwork and oak, and you see there, with its steep conical tile roof. The house walls and trellises combined thereby to make an outdoor room, a hortus conclusus, a garden full of flowers as a romantic setting for delight. Look at the garden of pleasure in this Flemish 15th century Romain de la Rose, the manuscript beloved by Morris, a garden wherein courting takes place around water fountains, just like Webb's Red House Well, within frames of rose-grown trellises, precursors of Morris's own trellis enclosures, which inspired his first wallpaper design in 1862. Under Morris's influence, the garden, in its relationship to the house, becomes more architectural, while the domestic interior becomes more natural. Yet this outdoor pleasure room made by the old plan and the rose trellises is literally only half the intended Red House story. In 1864, Webb made drawings for a scheme which would have expanded the L into a U plan, allowing Edward Byrne Jones and his family to have joined the Morrises to make a complete palace of art. This project was abandoned in sad circumstances following the death in 1864 of Edward and Georgina Byrne Jones's prematurely born second son. As shown in my perspective reconstruction, Webb's project would have extended Red House's raw red brick into a much richer material palette, reflecting the pattern and texture of the vernacular architecture of Southeast England, including a jetted upper story of half timber and plaster and tile hanging. The enlarged Red House would in fact have been much more like his later house in Standon, Sussex, which richly combines stone, brick, weatherboarding, tile hanging, and render. A key takeaway surface principle of all, all of this is that of layered shallow space, the kind of non-perspectival space you see in the medieval missal. In my analysis of the Roman de la Rose manuscript shown here on your left, <clears throat> The spatially layered garden components are wall and gate, flowery mead, fruit trees, fountain, and trellis enclosure. Especially in its complete U plan vision, <coughs> Red House, as seen on the right hand diagram, romantically layers similar elements. This layering principle of overlapping planes and patterns can be seen in this image of the later interior Morris created for the long drawing room in his home at Kelmscott House, Hammersmith. The shallow space of Byrne Jones's painting of backgammon players was inspired by the hortus conclusus of Red House's garden itself, with its defining trellises. The garden rose trellis, in turn, inspiring Morris's very first wallpaper design, Trellis, of 1862. The level of Morris's achievement can be seen if we compare the architectural layered flatness of trellis to one of the eclectic mid-century papers popular with the Victorian bourgeoisie, with its floridly naturalistic cabbage roses. As has been noted, Morris only worked very briefly as an architect with the great George Edmund Street in 1856. His biographer, Fiona McCarthy, suggests that it was from the street that he grasped two of the fundamental design principles that we have been exploring. <clears throat> Quote, street's sense of architecture as the center and the ruling force of all design activity and his technique in creating grand effects 
from myriad components. So that a Morris interior is a disciplined amalgam of patterns, colors, textures, wallpapers, friezes, cone fabrics, wall hangings, painted ceilings, layer upon layer. In the ideas of Ruskin and Morris, ornament is the artistic expression of the anonymous artisan rather than the creative genius. Although still firmly based on architecture, ornament can now migrate freely from the wall surface to other handcrafted objects and surfaces. We can see this happening in the drawing room Morris created in London's Holland Park for the Greek consul, where the ornament slips from the walls, themselves also layered with fabrics, paintings, and ceramics. It slips to the planes of the piano, the other pieces, and the carpets. Thus, the high and low of architecture and the decorative arts is elided. Beauty becomes a taken-for-granted backdrop to life and a constant reminder of the very skin and surface of the earth on which we dwell. Our third section examines, examines surfaces and the picturesque of Sharawagi in the 1930s to 1950s period. Under its editor, Hubert de Cronin Hastings, quite a name, the Architectural Review Journal sought to popularize architectural modernism by re-invoking picturesque theory, that national picture-making aptitude, as Hastings called it. As a term in English landscape writing, Sherawagi dates back to the late 17th century to describe the irregularity that travelers had admired in Chinese gardens. <coughs> the modernist landscape architect, Christopher Tunnard, had brought Sherawagi back into circulation in his book, Gardens in the Modern Landscape of 1938, where he praised, quote, the more important of the 18th century contributors to the art of garden design, the theorists of Sharawaji. As designers who had no faith in math mathematics and deified irregular irregularity, who found beauty in infinite variety and treated natural material according to that material's own potential organic pattern. Sergei Shemayev's Bentley Wood in Sussex, as well as being one of the outstanding modernist houses of the 1930s, had a tunnelled landscape design. Gordon Cullen's drawing layers the composition as three distinct shallow planes, a foreground sharawagi of trees and natural meadow, the white frame which marks the end of the terrace, <clears throat> and the modular timber ribbons of the house itself. Henry Moore's recumbent figure of 1938 would complete this layered totality of architecture, sculpture, and landscape. The review used strong drawings and photographs to advance its picturesque modernist campaign, especially the dazzling draftsmanship of Gordon Cullen as we have just seen. In January 1944, Hastings published in the review, Exterior Furnishing of Sharawagi, the Art of Making Urban Landscape, illustrated by Kenneth Roundtree. Hastings' caption to this collage's image enjoys us to, quote, match the variety of shape, pattern, and texture in the ornaments, wallpapers, fabrics, with an equally generous variety of shape, pattern, and texture and vegetation in urban exteriors. Make High Point lie down with the Victorian pub and the barge-boarded villa. Enjoy the railway signal and the rough stone wall and the pylon by the church." End quote. High Point, as highlighted, is the neo lucobusian slab block that in Roundtree's drawing rises above the barge-boarded villa. Over the high point-like flat block in his Sherawagi drawing, Roundtree strikes through hangings to write facades. Within the decorator's booth, he notates the wallpapers on their rack, the samplings of hangings and fabrics and the ornaments. Then out in the urban scene, along with the hangings that have now become facades, ornaments become objects of embellishments, <clears throat> wallpapers become surfaces, textures, 
and fabrics become growth vegetation. In agreement with Roundtree's panorama, Hastings finds the interior pattern becoming the exterior pattern, as he holds out the possibility that the urban planner's job might become one of exterior furnishing. You might already be reminded here by how much this trajectory in mid 20th century British modernism aligns with those trends we found earlier in the work of William Morris and the ideas of John Ruskin, whereby distinctions of high and low art, architecture and ornament, public and domestic, interior and exterior, house and garden become elided into a continuum of layered surface pattern. The High Point One flats in Highgate, London had been designed by Bertolt Lebetkin and the team of Tecton he had assembled. Lebetkin was a Russian emigre and the most outstanding architect working in Britain in the 1930s. And another key example, along with that of Pevsner, of the major contribution emigres made to British architectural culture in this period. In its pure translation of Le Corbusier's Five Points of a New White Architecture to these eight-story slabs poised on pilotes at the top of Highgate Hill, High Point One had unimpeachable high modernist credentials. As we shall shortly see, the change in language from Le Bitkin's High Point One of 1931 to High Point Two of 1938 it's a fascinating example of how an imported language, imported language and ideology is corrected, as it were, to the English architectural psychology, to the conditions of politics, climate and materiality that pertain in these islands. Parallels can be found in the 18th century when Italian Palladian models and elements are transformed as soon as they are introduced to this country. From the original plastic organic unity to isolated staccato decorative surface patterns. In British art in the Mediterranean, Saxel and Wittkera show how this happens in the case of the three light Venetian window. In Scamozzi's palace design of 1650 on the upper left, the window has a central hierarchic and functional role. By the time it reaches William Kent's Hokum Hall of 1734, bottom right, it has become merely a decorative pattern planted in the blank surface of a corner pavilion. When the Architectural Review published High Point Two in October 1938, it welcomed the change from the essentially diagrammatic character of the first High Point towards a surface of more character and purpose. And later, in 1951, as he reflected on this period, and is coming to terms with English climate and culture, the Betkin felt that the Mediterranean modernist abstraction at the 1934 high point had lacked impact in the London climate with its absence of light. So in designing high point two, he experimented <clears throat> with the richness of treatment so necessary in English climatic conditions by introducing a variety of materials full of elevational relief. Hence the rich palette of concrete fins, framing panels of brickwork and glazed tiles. Besides Tecton's aesthetic response to climate, they also had to contend with native conservatism, with our old friend Nimbyism. The Highgate Preservation Society had been formed to prevent any repeat of the vandalism of Highgate One in the old village. And the Architectural Review of October 1938 printed a Gordon Cullen drawing showing the Tweedy and Pinstripe residents of Highgate on the march, waving banners proclaiming St. George for Merry England and My Village Forever through streets that ironically were already a Sharawaggy potpourri of stuccoed Regency houses, modern Gothic buildings in red brick and pseudo-Georgian and Tudor villas alongside the flats of Highgate One. <clears throat> After World War II, Lebetkin and Tecton continued their experiments to humanize the expression of these great slab blocks, 
often to the alarm of hard modernist critics. The architectural reviews cover of November 1954 shows part of the access elevation of one of the slab blocks of the Hullfield estate in London's Paddington. Writing in the same issue on facade, the high modernist Rainer Bannon complained, the immediate impression is that the architect has dealt with this facade in an original, obtrusive, and alarming manner. <clears throat> obtrusive and alarming because, Bannon goes on, facade treatments do not form part of the common theory of the modern movement, as our elders and betters have left it. In the pure theory, the problem of the facade does not exist. Form follows function. And when the problems of the interior have been correctly resolved, the exterior form will be found to have crystallized into an unarguable solution. <clears throat> That's high modernism for you. <clears throat> but as experience tells us, the problem of the facade, of the handling of surface and material, does exist. And function alone will not automatically solve it, as you discover every day in the design studio. Lubetkin wrestled constantly with this problem, seeking, quote, to take the basic rhythm proceeding from the plan and to further develop this rhythm in an overall pattern of light and shade, bringing human scale to the main abstract forms, end quote. To this end, he drew on his whole memory and experience, ranging from the Caucasian Galin carpets he had known in his youth to the facade rhythms of the 15th century Palace of Urbino, that's up on the upper left. <clears throat> in conclusion to this third section, Hastings, writing now under his nom de plume of Ivor de Wolf, formalized Sharawagi in the Architectural Review of December 1949 as townscape, as a radical principle which, in its individ individualistic and empirical way of looking at the world, might, he claimed, be called perennially English. A townscape casebook marked Gordon Cullen's debut as the brilliant draftsman and advocate of the cut and paste surface scapes of the townscape urban scene. All is magnificently summed up in Cullen's townscape of 1961. In the Englishness of English art, Pevsner offers the market square of Harlow Newtown as an example of the optics of the picturesque applied to urban planning. It might easily be one of Gordon Cullen's townscape collages come to life. <clears throat> so we have seen Morris's wallpapers, the wallpaper-like patterns of the Sharawagi townscape, and now we even have brutalist wallpaper. For Alison and Peter Smithson, this 1956 photograph was a classic brutalist image. It shows the bathroom in their small Chelsea terraced house. Here they wrote, the so-called as found was celebrated. The bath stood naked on its four legs. The lavatory chain hung galvanized before Eduardo Paolozzi wallpaper. The third key quality of the new brutalism as defined by Rainer Banner in 1955 was this valuation of materials for their inherent qualities as found. And as in the irregular all over markings of this wallpaper, brutalism relished the fracture of surfaces. Here is artist Paolozzi with the Smithsons and the photographer Nigel Henderson. As in the arts and crafts period and the 1930s, the 1950s saw strong interactions between architects, artists, and artisans. This photograph is from the catalogue to the important collaborative This Is Tomorrow exhibition held at the Whitechapel Art Gallery in September 1956. Between 1949 and 1953, Henderson lived in the war-scarred East End of London and photographed the scarified surfaces of its pavements, walls, and shop fronts as found. The random arcs and scratchings of graffiti on a door window are not unlike the bathroom wallpaper. In 1952, the Smithsons designed the, offices for, the office for Ronald Jenkins, the engineer at Ovi Arab who worked with them 
on their homestand from school. Paolozzi contributed the ceiling wallpaper, which accepted the creative accidents of its printing and pasting. As in brutalism generally, the mark making is, a, is at once primitive, naturalistic, and mechanistic. Are these thorny thickets overhead or industrial antennae? The art theorist Anton Ehrensweg helped Paolozzi with printing this paper, and his psychoanalytic ideas argued for the disruption of conscious surface coherence to open up unconscious channels of creativity. Against, for example, the articulate gestalt of Henry Moore's direct carving, towards the inarticulate creative accidents of this ceiling wallpaper. Constantin School is far more than a direct homage to the steel language Mies van der Rohe had evolved at IIT Chicago. As English Palladianism had corrected Palladio, so, as Raina Bannum observes, Constantin corrected Miesian elegance. How securely, says Bannum, within ingrained English tradition is the insistence on a pure geometrical grid of horizontals and verticals, and an air of suppressed extremism, of gentlemanly bloody-mindedness imprisoned within the grid. In Ruskin's praise of the savage craftsman, in Butterfield's pugnacity, in Philip Webb's awkward honesty, and the Smithsons as found, the integrity of an almost ugliness is preferred to specious beauty. As, Huns as Hunstanton shows, it is simplistic to always equate brutalism with literal roughness of surface. At the same time, a major inspiration is, of course, the beton brew, the raw concrete of the post war Le Corbusier of the Unité d'Habitation, and the primitive primitivist brickwork of the Maison Jeanne. James Sterling and James Garan's textual brick <coughs> and concrete flats at Ham Common reference the Maison Jeanne, but are much neater than Corbusier's conscious roughness. For Bannum, brutalism as a going style proved to be largely a matter of surfaces derived from Jeanne. The Leicester University Engineering Building is the famous climax to this phase of Sterling's work. Again, in partnership with James Gowan, again in partnership with James Gowan, reviewing this period of intense English architectural polemics, Bannum wrote of the revenge of the picturesque, undermining, in his view, the rational principles which are the basis of the modern movement. Even Leicester, he saw, quote, as an asymmetrical composition of towers and low buildings that fully deserves the name of picturesque. At Leicester, the surfaces are faceted skins of hard red acritin bricks, red Dutch clay tiles, and industrial patent glazing. Sterling always rejected any charges of postmodernism made against his later work, yet the Claw Gallery extension for Tate Britain is at least lowercase postmodernism if not fully uppercase homo. Here again, the British picturesque is a strong influence, but arrived at by a rather circular route. Sterling admired Carl Friedrich Schinkel's gardener house at Charlottenhof near Potsdam, where the informality of his buildings harmonizes with the surrounding free English model landscape by Peter Joseph Lenné. As his sketches reveal, Sterling saw his new wing as almost a garden wall, applying to it an abstractly scissored veneer of stone, stucco, and brick. Sterling's loving attention to the claw's surfaces is evident in the suite of up few axonometric presentation drawings he personally drew and meticulously patched. We end where we began with Hardwick Hall and with Caruso St. John's Walsall Art Gallery, which opened in February 2000. Among the gallery's many inspirations are the cubic volumes, stairs, and galleries of Hardwick. Unlike Hardwick, at Walsall, only a scattering of flush windows marks its intriguing skin, whose large-scale clay tiles 
allude to the Potteries heritage of Walsall. In Caruso St. John's work, we can see the ongoing vitality of traditions of surface shaping and materiality. Thank you. <laughs> so, any questions? It's, it's always interesting when you lecture to a, a group, you never know how familiar. Some of you are probably just done your dissertation on High Point One. <laughs> or some of you know Townscape backwards, some of you may never have heard of it. Um, I imagine you've all, you all know Red House, don't you? Is it Miles of Red House? Yes. It's in all the it's in all the textbooks as a canonic piece of modernism. Um, or perhaps you're familiar with all these things, and you, uh, but hopefully I've drawn, managed to draw on some sort of looping <laughs> surface thread through them. radical in the 1850s. Um, and it also, um, under the influence of Ruskin Brick, became quite a posh material, something you could use for grand Victorian churches as opposed to the stone. The, the, the vigorous polychrome was also, as I said briefly, you know, when you had so much soot everywhere, you needed surfaces that were bright and strident and, and even washable, because everything was rapidly covered in uh, Again, you are too young to remember when cities were black, and Charles is too young. But I can remember when, you know, London and Newcastle, uh, Paris, all the buildings were black because they were still covered in soot. soot. Uh, President Mitterrand in Paris was the first to start cleaning buildings, and suddenly, because you had clean air acts in Paris, reappeared as a sort of Leaving stone cities instead of a black one. Now you've had time to think of some questions. Are they doing a dissertation? Is it? Not a master's. Mm. They're doing uh, an essay. An essay, right. Stage. Right, okay. A manifesto without a picture. Well, some of this might filter into the old manifesto. <laughs> When you're designing, do you um, pay attention to the surface? I think a little bit more now. <laughs> <laughs> if it's done that, it's been worth it. Been worth well, is it? <laughs> uh, or all these potentialities of material and texture and, and so on. Um, I'm sure you don't believe it, but there was a time when architects did think that if you, you organised the plan and sorted out the program, the form of the building would appear yeah. as if they are magic, um, which is what critics like Lena Bannon thought. And this this play of facades, like I was showing you, is a Paddington estate and the Beckham estate, whose modernist credentials cannot be faulted, but it's seen as formalist, you know, really nasty work. <laughs> uh, just playing with form for its own state, but um, it, it did cause a lot of angst at the, at the time. Yeah. It's, 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 it
it does come over that it's, it, if you have the surface to that extent, it's, it's a luxury. Yeah. There's, there's no time to think about what it's made of and how it's put together. Yes. Is, is there a, bag, a black bag between other tiles? Or yes, and, that, um, and sometimes in my design, and sometimes it's nice to take time out and just study a wall there of your project. In, yeah. Okay. I mean, that's the, the diagram that you show of uh, the two elevations or two versions of an elevation. Uh, it's quite lovely to see that. Was that so the. Um, that was the Libet Lib 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 one way. Oh, that's oh, oh, pass it. Oh, yes, right. Um, the Sterling one, you mean? Yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, it is, it's always wonderful to look at Sterling's drawings. I mean, absolutely wonderful, one of the very great architects of the 20th century, I think, but um, one who could certainly one of the few British architects of true international stature and so But his drawings are wonderful. Um, um, well, this one is clearly. In a slightly postmodern way, he is very much considering the elevation and the surfaces. But he, but he also had that sense, as in the um, the Lebetkin, the um, this, uh, no, I, don't, I haven't got it. There. No, it's in the book. Um, but there's there's sort of wonder, his, his wonderful and an axonometrics where he looks at the the building almost as like a collection of machined parts um, where the spaces are. Like cast volumes, which he assumed. So he has that feeling, um, which he learned from people like Moretti and so on as well. But and he was able to absorb everything um, that postmodernism had to teach about urbanism and history without the literal. This means that of the worst kind of the Robert Graves type of decorated shed sort of postmodernism, which can be a bit clunky. Do you know the are you familiar with the work of Fat F A T? The, the, a more recent practice who uh, rediscovering postmodernism. Have you read Venturi's Complexity and Contradiction in Modern Architecture? Well, we should read that. It's one of the one of the it's one of the canonic texts of the post Second World War, uh, but it, well, it it embodies a lot of that thinking that was becoming postmodernism at the time. Um, Still no questions, but we'll think of them after. They'll, they'll come shuffling up when, at the end of the lecture. <laughs> it's, it's quite lovely to hear from you that he talks about something that is designed to be beautiful or sublime. Yes, also, well, yes. Sub yes, all those categories, yes. I, I can go to talk to about that. No. I think the word beauty is kind of beauty. People are very nervous of using the word beauty, yeah. um, but beauty is coming back. There's a there's a slightly um, still a slightly iffy side to it. Um, I mean, Roger Scruton talks about beauty, and there's a sort of there's a lot of Prince of Wales sort of boundary baggage once you mention the <laughs> word. But, but people are also using the word beauty in a in a in a, in a, in a serious way. There's nothing terribly wrong with beauty, but um, yeah. I think very much think that it's like a part of our time that we get really wrapped up in floor plans and a lot of form and we tend to miss out on like the minute details that, that are solid and really detailing. As you said, that like, picturesque and mental roughness. Yes. We all know those are ruins and things and we enjoy it so much but then we have to pick up those elements put it into our architecture because it's almost we get wrapped up in one thing and then we yes. never see the building as as as, a, as much detail as this, especially in Yes, you, you'll, you'll, you'll do the plans and the program, you'll perhaps make a lovely card model, but the card model remains Art. immaterial. <laughs> 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 I, mean, I, I, I know from, well, I'm emeritus now, but I remember from my not so long ago time in the design studio, that, um, you, you'll ask the student, is it be a lovely composition, right? And then you'll say, ask them, what is it made of? And it's almost something that's done in the last week before. <laughs> yes. If you make a wall concrete, that concrete record is the most beautiful. If you make mm. something stone, that roughness is never going to pick up. So 
right the, the right way. It's never going to catch the light correctly. Your renders are never going to look as good as they would. No. The surface is just concrete. So I think that for the sake of how how we want our buildings to look, how we want to present them, especially in architecture school, we lose so much of that materiality because we don't know how to make it look as mm. beautiful as it would in person. Yes. Yes, it becomes a sort of wall, slicko wallpaper that's yeah. applied again often late in the day. Whereas, <laughs> <laughs> right. you know, Louis Kahn asking a brick, what brick, what do you want to be? And you want know, to sort of begin with the brick and then literally draw as you build, Louis Kahn said, you know, think, draw as you build and make a line at the construction joint. So you've got to keep that. Tectonic and material and surface thing. <laughs> yeah. The book is in the library now, is it? Yes, and 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 there is an e-book, so you can follow it up. Um, in, there's a sample copy there if you want to look at it afterwards. Um, um, there are some flyers at which there's a twenty percent off. I know budgets are limited, <laughs> but they um, it, it should be in the library in a physical and e-book e form. In the fullness of time, anyway. Oh well, it's nice. It's a nice. I, I know a lot of this will be picked up by other people virtually. But it's always nice to, in this age of Zoom, it's nice to be in a real room with real people. Because <laughs> there are so much is Zoom now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.